Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Decoding the Unknown. This one, the Clinton body counts. <laughs> Isn't this that, like, obviously, I'm g <laughs> gonna start this one off by assuming this isn't real. Because if it was like, yeah, look at all these people who died around Bill and Hillary Clinton so they could get where they are, I'd be like, well, if there was really evidence for that, they'd, they'd be in prison. Wouldn't they? People are probably screaming at me now, like, are you aware of the high-level corruption? There's a pizza place with children in the basement, or something like this. And it's like, look, the guy who was president... Is like being indicted for all sorts of like fraud and stuff. It's like they're totally happy to go after the people in charge. Like sometimes. And it might sound like oh, someone you've got a way too positive view of this. And I'm sure other people are screaming like, it's because he's a Republican. Hillary Clinton's a Democrat. It's like if she had killed people, they'd be doing something about it. <laughs> So with that out of the way, I've just put off, what, 90% of the audience with my various anti-conspiracy rantings, but it is what it is. This one's written by Matt. Thank you, Matt. Um, first one, Matt, Matt Markham, who's uh, written for Casual Criminals previously, but he's left me a note here saying this is my first script for Decoding the Unknown, so let me know how it goes. Okay, I will. Matt, honestly, though, your writing is usually, it's really really good so i think you're probably gonna be handle this able to handle this rather well it's a well accepted theory oh if you're new to the show <laughs> there's a lot of rambling here and uh, i've never read this before that's the format we're gonna read it together we're gonna have a good time let's go i get the feeling i am gonna have a good time with this one this feels like one of those ones is gonna be a good laugh <laughs> It's a well-accepted fact that any American politician who has served multiple terms in Congress likely has more than a few skeletons hiding in their closet. After all, one does not make it to Washington, D.C. and remain there long-term without cutting a few deals and greasing a few palms. Yeah, it's like, I've heard that said about, like, businesses. Like, you don't become a billionaire without breaking a few legs or something. <laughs> it's like, yeah, anyone who is that successful has done some shady a I feel like the more successful you get, the more shady you do i haven't like got to the point where it's like let's do some shady shit. but i hope to get there at some point i hope to be in that leg breaking bill clinton crowd not that bill clinton's broken any legs that's allegedly it's just a joke <laughs> i'm joking that's just a joke we like to have fun here as far as i'm aware <laughs> i read bill clinton's uh autobiography i went through a stage of reading loads of political biographies autobiographies like i read prime ministers i read presidents all the way back to like bush senior maybe i haven't read reagan's I read a lot of, like, presidential biographies at one point, and, and politi political biographies. Because it was super interesting. Anyway, you either play by the unwritten rules, you find a few corporate donors to keep your campaigns funded and avoid making waves, or you're destined to be an outcast among DC's upper echelon. While I'm aware that this may sound like a pessimistic view of the American government, mm, sounds like a realistic view, uh, that's because it is. Simon likes to say things may have gotten better over time, and while I generally agree, I would also argue that politics is the exception to that rule. Even with cameras pointed at our leaders every day, corporate bribes, insider trading and embezzlement, they're all expected perks of the job at this point is that i i, I, I gotta say like yeah i guess wasn't there that like insider trading thing recently where it's like it, and isn't there some rule in america where it's like yeah you don't you don't you can't get control for that if you're like in some position or something and then they were like using this to their advantage to essentially do insider trading which is like a free money cheat code in a video game it's like what the fuck? <laughs> like how is that allowed especially when like someone who's not a politician like, i always think about martha Stuart and I was like her broker calls her up at like three in the morning and is like Martha we gotta sell like look I might be getting this wrong it's a half remembered thing and it's like so the broker phones her up and is like Martha we've got to sell this and she's like okay look you're the money dude just do it like honestly like I have people and then phone me up and be like Simon we need to do this and I'll be like all right <laughs> yeah I'm assuming you're not gonna do anything illegal because uh, you know why would you why would you and then I'll be like, yeah, sure, sell. And then the next thing, FBI! And it's like, what have I done? What? What did I do wrong? And they're like, you inside a trojan. And I'm like, I inside a what? <laughs> For <laughs> Mother Stewart is so unborn. And she went to like prison, right? <laughs> Jesus. But at least she's got some good stories from prison, I bet. Today's episode is brought to you by one of my absolute favorite sponsors, and that is Vessi. Vessi have been a sponsor for years, and since they have been a sponsor, since I got introduced to them, I have pretty much never worn any other shoe. Vessi provide unparalleled comfort, making them the most comfortable footwear that you will ever experience. Certainly the most comfortable footwear that I've ever experienced. I'm, not, I'm wearing them right now. Like, this is the new Vessi Soho. Haven't worn that yet. It's nice and crispy clean, and I'm a little bit like, oh... 
I'll wear it and then it's not as beautiful and white but I've been wearing these uh these are the boardwalks been wearing them all summer uh and yeah it's getting into winter I might wear these home today I think that's going to be nice I think I'll do that wet Vessi shoes are 100% waterproof thanks to something called Dymatex which is a uh, material that basically allows you to go walking in rivers as you can see from this b-roll but most importantly it keeps your sock dry when it's a little bit rainy outside plus it's totally breathable it's not like wearing Wellington boots or rain boots or whatever Americans call them uh, you don't get sweaty feet. Your feet stay cool in the summer and dry in the winter. It's amazing. The Vessi is more than just shoes. It's a lifestyle. They're easy to clean. They're comfortable. They've got the Soho perfect for any occasion. And it's not just about staying dry. They've got this synthetic leather exterior, these grippy outsoles, padded collar for universal comfort. It's super, super nice. But what if it's not just your feet that need protection? Meet the overcast jacket. It's also 100% waterproof with a stretchy shell that is going to adapt to your every move. Soft fleece lining keeps you cozy and adjustable features protect you from unpredictable weather. And you can get your own Vessies with a 15% discount now at vessi.com slash unknown. Check them out. The link is in the description. And now back to today's video. Everybody in Washington knows about it, but nobody wants to be the person to put the brakes on the party bus. However, while joining on the corruption may keep you in the good graces of those within your own political party, eventually some scandal is bound to rock your world. It's an obstacle that cannot be avoided, and deciding how to best address the problem at hand is hugely important. Every scandal has the potential to be the end of your political career. One minute you're sitting pretty, and the next you're on a plane back to your home state as the entire country shares leaked screenshots of text messages between you and your mistress. Ah! This happens all the time. It's like at least once a year, there's some mega juicy story, isn't there? So with everything in Washington being as cutthroat as it is, how do some people manage to remain electable for decades? Well, if you're Bill and Hillary Clinton, then you don't need to worry about it because everyone with dirt on you has a nasty habit of dying prematurely in inexplicable ways. Yes, although the Clintons are no stranger to controversy and scandal themselves, it's, believe <laughs> it's like, wait, they've got loads of stuff. How come the, like, when I think of, like, scandalous politicians, literally Bill Clinton is the first person who comes to mind. Because it's like, I did not have an affair with that woman. <laughs> and it's like, but Bill, you did. <laughs> It's like the fan affair. <laughs> it's like Bill. And then Hillary Clinton. I didn't understand the whole email thing. It was like, well, she was sending she was sending emails from her I don't know why I'm doing Bill Clinton's voice still. Or like my impression of Bill Clinton's voice, which is just generic Arkansas. Not even that. Just generic South Southern. Like, I don't understand Hillary Clinton in her emails. It was like, wait. So she just sent some, like, work emails from her personal email address. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, I'm not supposed to be doing that? I mean, I, mean, I assume it's a government thing. Because all, I, like, my Gmails are just combined into one. And sometimes I'll email someone from this. Sometimes I'll email someone from that. Uh, wait, am I admitting to crimes here? Because I'm pretty sure that's fine. <laughs> the worst is I was like, yo, why'd that go into my spam? Simon, why did you send this from your personal Gmail? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't care. Any minute now. FBI! <laughs> But I assume it's because, like, if I was a politician or, like, dealing with classified information or something, they'd probably be like, yeah, you've got to stop that. You've got to use the, like, secure login and you can't have a home server. And I'm like, what the f is a home server? I just use Gmail. What the f are you talking about? What's going on? What's going Why is life so complicated? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. Yes, yeah, so although the Clintons are no controversy to strangers themselves, yeah, what I was saying is, like, why didn't someone knock off the woman, the per person who leaked? Hillary Clinton's emails or Bill Clinton's affair. How come Monica Lewinsky is still alive? It is believed that some have avoided the worst consequences of their actions by causing dozens of deaths, if not hundreds. This is what's known as the Clinton body count conspiracy, and how exactly they caused these deaths is irrelevant. Perhaps they used their money and power to have someone do the killing for them, or perhaps Bill himself was the one hopping the White House fence in the night with a heart attack gun hidden inside his saxophone case. That's it. That's it. Bill Clinton, secret assassin. That sounds like a good book. <laughs> Bill Clinton wrote that book, uh, The President is Missing, that I read. He wrote it with, like, I don't know, John Grisham or someone, like one of these super popular like writers. It's not John Grisham. Um, is it Kevin Patterson? No, that's not his name. James Peterson? Kevin Peterson? Jordan Peterson? <laughs> like, he wrote this book, and it was, like, mildly entertaining, but it just mostly seemed like a way for Bill Clinton to say all the things that he wished he could have said as president. <laughs>
<laughs> it was very cringe. Either way, this is a conspiracy theory that has roots stretching as far back as the early 90s, and yet even today it continues to be one of the most well-known and widely believed political conspiracies in America, often reappearing alongside other modern conspiracies such as QAnon and Jeffrey Epstein. I know that, like, QAnon, clear conspiracy, like, load of nonsense, bunkum. Jeffrey Epstein, holy <laughs> is that suspicious. That's like the Kennedy thing, I'm like... <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I might be on the conspiracy theorist side with this one. I was looking at a conspiracy theorist Reddit or something today for ideas, and it's like, oh boy, there are some crazy ones out there. Like, it, uh, it's a forum for like conspiracy people who believe conspiracies, not just like making fun of them or whatever. And these people go deep. It's like, whoa, bro, really, bro? <laughs> Yes, it is a conspiracy theory that has proven it has staying power needed to remain relevant, but is there any evidence whatsoever to support it? Conspiracy origins. To tackle this very lengthy topic, the script isn't massively long. Okay, so settle in, but not too, too bad. I think we'll be here an hour. I'm going to break down the major deaths related to the conspiracy one by one and try not to overwhelm you with information because there is a lot to cover. Some deaths will be discussed in great detail, while others will only receive a single paragraph or may be skipped entirely for the sake of time. The ones focused on in this episode will be the most notable and or most suspicious. I'm not going to spend much time introducing Bill or Hillary Clinton because they're so well known and accomplished. Good. <laughs> I was trying to think of a joke there, but it's like, nah, they are. It's Bill and Hillary Clinton. They're like the most famous politicians ever. Right? They got, they're like, they're like up there in like modern times. Because like Bill Clinton was president. Hillary Clinton was like almost president. And then secretary of state or something like that. Because she couldn't get elected. Because she's a woman. <laughs> Just joking. But maybe people are sexist. I'll only be providing a brief description of who they are and any other necessary information about their lives and career will be discussed in depth in later sections once it becomes relevant to the particular death that we are discussing. I once pronounced Arcan Arkansas, where Bill Clinton's from, as Arkansas, and everyone was like, ah, Arkansas? <laughs> Arkansas? <laughs> it's because it's spelt Arkansas. And with that being said, all you need to know about Bill and Hillary is they're considered by many to be the ultimate power couple in American politics, both having occupied powerful positions in state and federal government at different times throughout the past 40 years. Bill is a licensed attorney, the former, gov former governor of Arkansas, and most notably, the 42nd president of the United States. Hillary is also a licensed attorney, a former U.S. senator for New York State, a former secretary of state for the United States, and Donald Trump's main political rival in the 2016 presidential election. Both Bill and Hillary are lifelong Democrats, have raised a daughter together and have been involved in numerous scandals involving alleged financial improprieties and various abuses of office. Bill has also famously been involved in multiple scandals surrounding sexual misconduct, including one that it resulted in impeachment in 1998 while serving his second term as president. Wait, does impeachment mean, ah, uh, impeachment, to be successfully impeached doesn't mean impeachment. Like, you could, the bringing of proceedings is impeachment, right? Because that always confused me. I'm like, wait, you got impeached? Like, that means he, he got kicked out. And it's like, no, that's like successful impeachment or something. Together, they're often referred to as the Clintons, and they continue to be two of the most divisive people in American politics. So where did the idea that they're cold-blooded killers originate? According to most sources, an essay titled The Clinton Body Count, Confidence or the Kiss of Death, was the, was the first written document to be distributed that implied Bill Clinton may be involved in the deaths of some of his friends, acquaintances, and business associates, although it wouldn't take long for Hillary's involvement in the deaths to be assumed as well. Bill Clinton is one of these people, apparently. Like, I I've heard this on the press, and then I met someone, or I know someone who met Bill Clinton, and he was like, yeah or she was like the person who met at him was like yeah he just has this thing like you just want to like him you meet him and you're like oh my god we're gonna be friends it's bill i just want to say i like you because <laughs> he's like so charismatic it's kind of amazing i wish i had that just that thing where it's like everyone likes you for no reason <laughs> it's like yes i guess i don't have it because i'm uh, although it wouldn't take long for Hillary's involvement in the deaths to be assumed as well. This essay was written in 1993 by Linda Thompson, an attorney from Indianapolis, Indiana, and it lists 34 deceased people by name. However, it did not outright accuse the Clintons of murder for legal reasons. Yeah, if you're, she, it said she's an attorney. Yeah, an attorney. She's not going to be like, they did it. She's going to be like, allegedly, some people might say that they think this. The administration, the document begins, this administration seems to be plagued with an inordinate number of suicides, plane crashes, one person fatal accidents, and unexplained 
deaths. The following is a summary of the deaths of people who have died, none of them from natural causes, who are connected to Bill Clinton. The list goes on to name many of the people we will be speaking about in greater detail later in today's episode, as well as a brief description of their relation to the Clintons, a quick overview of the circumstances surrounding their deaths, and anything else Linda found noteworthy enough to include. It does not, however, provide any verifiable evidence that the Clintons were involved in the deaths. Essentially, this document simply says, look at all these deaths. Pretty weird, huh? Somebody should look into this. And that's it. Linda herself even admitted as much and said that she didn't believe the Clintons had killed anybody personally. The deaths on her list were likely caused by someone trying to control the president from the shadows. Holy sh**. Yeah, I'm like, I don't think Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton cl killing anybody. But someone who wants them in power, just like knocking off people who are in their way, and then being just like, oh, that's convenient, isn't it? Like, imagine if someone was just killing your enemies just without you knowing. You'd be like, wow, my enemies keep on dying. It'd be like, brilliant. <laughs> I'm not killing them, so it's fine. I'm hands clean. But like, wow. Super convenient. Someone just killing off all those other conspiracy channel people? All those other educational YouTubers? Like, oh no. I mean, that would be sad because I they're, they're not my enemies. <laughs> but you get what I mean. Oh God. I'm not wishing death on anybody. It's just a joke. It's a stupid joke. Some of these people are my friends. <laughs> Her main goal, she stated in interviews, was to start a conversation, and in that, she certainly succeeded. Shortly after the list's release, California Congressman William Danamar latched onto the idea of Bill Clinton being a murderer, trimmed the list of 34 names down to 24, and then submitted this new list to the United States Congress to be reviewed. By this point, the conspiracy was already gaining traction, and news outlets, particularly those opposed to Clinton's presidency, were quick to report on the story while not directly saying that Bill or Hillary had orchestrated anyone's death. No, otherwise that would have been the settlement before the more recent one for Fox News. Wasn't that 700 something million? <laughs> Accusing Bill Clinton, the president of murder, is going to get you in some legal hot water. Like Linda Thompson, they were just pointing out how suspicious all these deaths were. The tabloids, on the other hand, did not hold back, and began running headlines insinuating that Bill himself had blood on his presidential cufflinks. I wasn't joking in the intro when I said that some people legitimately believe that Bill Clinton was sneaking out of the White House to commit murder. No! People this powerful don't kill people themselves. They have people who kill people for them. Like, <laughs> that's how they do it. After this, the conspiracy took on a life of its own and spread quickly throughout the United States with the help of political commentators like Rush Limbaugh and religious figures like Pat Robinson. I have no idea who these people are. Why would religious figures be talking about this? Many took the unsubstantiated claims as fact, and during the 30 years since the release of Linda Thompson's essay, many more names have been added to her list. Vincent Foster in 1994, an article titled, Whatever It Is, Bill Clinton Likely Did It, was published in the US News & World Report by authors Greg Ferguson and David Bowermaster. Within it, they say, the starting place for all Clinton murder theorists seems to be Vincent Foster. This turned out to be right on the money, as his death was the most notable mentioned within Linda Thompson's paper, and it continues to raise many eyebrows to this day, but is there any evidence? As many people alive at the time remember, Bill, Vincent Foster was one of Bill Clinton's personal White House advisors and a former legal aide at their firm prior to Bill's presidency. I mean, I was I was alive during Bill Clinton's presidency, but I like my political awareness only like I remember when George Bush got elected. So what was that? 2000? I was 12. So that's kind of like I remember my aunt was visiting from America. She's American and George Bush had just been elected. And I was like, how do you feel about that? Because, like, it was just after Bill Clinton and his enormous scandals and all of this. And it's like, Bill Clinton, to my 12 year old mind, was a terrible, like, person. Like, oh my God, how's he, what's he up to? He's the president. He's doing all this crazy stuff. Like, I did not have an affair. And I didn't understand politics at all. And my aunt was like, well, I'm not very happy. Because <laughs> he's like, George Bush doesn't represent my political interests. And I'm like, oh, I just didn't get it. I was like, isn't it good that Bill Clinton's gone? She's like, no. <laughs> Foster's death occurred during Clinton's first term in office and was a major point of speculation for conspiracy theorists because it coincided with a Clinton-era scandal known as Travelgate. This will be the first of many scandals that we'll be discussing as we move forward. The Travelgate scandal began in May of 1993 when then-President Bill Clinton ordered the termination of seven executive-level federal employees who each worked in highly coveted positions at the White House Travel and Telegraph Office. Essentially, these employees were in charge of overseeing the travel arrangements of the White House Press Corps and their firing was noteworthy because several of the 
men terminated had held their position since before Bill Clinton himself had entered politics. For several decades, they had served at the pleasure of both Republican and Democratic presidents without issue, and their work had never been called into question. Officially, the White House's declared justification for this decision was a multi-year, multi-presidential investigation by the FBI that had revealed financial fraud had taken place within the office during past administrations. Well, fine. If that's true, yeah, people deserve to get fired. If they've been committing fraud for a long-ass time, you're gonna lose your job. At least. Legally, since all seven men served at the pleasure of the sitting president, Bill Clinton was well within his right to fire them. However, the press uncovered evidence that there was another reason for Clinton's decision. After the men were fired, Clinton appointed his own friends and campaign donors to the, those newly vacant, highly covered positions. Um, again, if they... So they were, these are two separate things. You really need to view them as separate things. Like, I'm not trying to defend Bill Clinton. Like, I'm not American. I don't give a shit about your politics. Uh, but if these if it's true that these people got fired for financial fraud then those are positions are open and obviously bill clinton being the person to appoint them he's going to appoint the people that he wants to appoint there if it turns out that you've re you've really got to prove the onus is on whoever's making these accusations you've got to prove that the FBI investigation was a sham. To this day, both Bill and Hillary claim that the entire scandal was fabricated by the media, but nevertheless, Clinton was forced to fire his friends and reinstate the original seven employees due to the backlash. You've got to be me. Even though the FBI were like, yo, they've done fraud. And Bill Clinton's like, yeah, but look at the optics. And the FBI are like, what the fuck, Bill? How long did we do this investigation, Bill? Multiple presidencies. How long have you been in office? Six weeks, Bill? F you. Calm down. In truth, my explanation of Travelgate does not include many of the important smaller details of the controversy because it's just a single part of a much larger scandal that we'll talk about in a later section. The ethics investigation that resulted from this larger scandal outlived Clinton's presidency and stretched well into George W. Bush's first term. Some at the time thought it had the potential to be the next Watergate. Whether that was just hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Whether that was just hyperbole. Hyperbole hyperbole is the weirdest written word ever, isn't it? Why is it written a hyperbole? <laughs> Uh, it was up to who you asked and where they fell on the political spectrum. However, getting back to what this video is about, the reason Travelgate is important to us is because Visitant Foster died during the media fallout from this scandal. On July the 20th, 1993, Foster's body was discovered in Fort Macy Park near George Washington Parkway in Virginia. He had been killed by a single round from a 38 caliber handgun that had been fired into the roof of his mouth. The handgun was found in his hand at the scene. Well, it sounds like a suicide, but I'm going to guess that it's not. They're going to be like, well, we know it's not a suicide. Someone made it look like a suicide because otherwise it would just be simple suicide if this is just simple suicide i'm gonna be very disappointed they'd be like nah the emmy was like yeah it looks exactly like suicide gunpowder residue on his hand it didn't fly away from him like people say they do it's just like it's it's a bang up suicide that's it straightforward easy during the investigation that was conducted by local authorities police learned that foster had been seeking help for his mental health the day before his death and he also told his friends and colleagues that he couldn't handle the personal and professional humiliation that the investigation into travelgate had caused him he knew he would likely have to testify before congress and was considering resigning from his post to escape the national spotlight however he was conflicted because he knew he would be ha never never be happy if he returned to his home state a miserable failure learning this it didn't take long for the police to rule Foster's death a suicide. Days later, their theory was further confirmed when a draft of a handwritten suicide note slash resignation letter, which had been ripped into 28 separate pieces, was discovered inside Foster's briefcase inside his office. This letter was found by one of Foster's colleagues, a man named Steve Neuwirth, and it was then immediately turned over to another of Clinton's advisers, Bernard Nussbaum, who then turned it over to federal authorities the following day. So, where does the conspiracy theory come into play. Yeah, it just seems like a straightforward suicide so far, doesn't it? Well, part of it started when Police Major Robert Hines, a police officer president at the park when Foster's body was first discovered, stated publicly to the media that he had not seen an exit wound on the back of Foster's head. Seeing as one would expect a 38 caliber round to easily create an exit wound when fired from such a close range, this statement made the entire investigation appear shady because it ran counter to the police's official statement. Okay, so he just didn't see it. That's all. That doesn't mean it wasn't there. Have a look at the autopsy report. Following this, the ripped-up resignation letter was analyzed by three independent handwriting experts who each concluded that it was undoubtedly a forgery. 
Oh my. In interviews given to the media in 1995, these experts claimed that the letter had been written by someone with a moderate knowledge of forgery and at first glance could pass as real. Under increased scrutiny, however, several key indicators of forgery could be detected. They also provided a detailed breakdown of these indicators so that laymen like us could easily follow along. First, there was an unusual amount of hesitation dots found throughout the document where the writer replaced the pen to paper and held it there for a moment before writing. Well, yes, because he's not writing a grocery list, he's writing a suicide note of course he's gonna pause for thought this wouldn't have been considered strange if these marks had been in expected places such as at the start of a sentence but some words showed multiple hesitation marks within a single word sometimes in a single letter in one instance there was the letter n that had been written using only three strokes but showed four hesitation marks okay i see okay there's a little picture of it here i see those hesitation marks Additionally, when observing the number of strokes used to create individual words and letters, experts noted several major deviations between Foster's typical writing style and the writing style seen in the resignation letter. Normally, Foster used one long, confident stroke, but there was one particular B present in the letter that had been written using four separate sloppy strokes. This indicated them to them that someone had likely been trying very hard to copy Foster's style without much practice or experience. In total, the experts were able to point out 12 separate indicators within the letter that they asserted were only present in cases of forgery. Further adding to the speculation, the letter had not been signed and no clear fingerprints or handprints from Foster were found anywhere on the paper, despite it being a lengthy document that would have taken him a considerable time to write. That's mad suspicious. Why? It's that is really strange. There was one smudged handprint found on the paper, however, it was later determined to belong to Bernard Nussbaum, Clinton's other advisor, who had turned the letter into the authorities three days after Foster's death. Following these revelations, the conspiracy theorists were off to the races, and several articles were written that alleged Bill Clinton had ordered Foster's death in order to cover up information relating to Travelgate and bury other sensitive information about his life and crimes that, as his lawyer, Foster was privy to. Um, so, two things going on here. One is did he really commit suicide and then the second one is did bill clinton order the suicide i'm very skeptical about the suicide thing that note which and i assume handwriting analysis is a real thing unlike you know um oh what's that the, the bloody polygraph machine or didn't someone say recently like blood spatters no longer like a proper police technique or something or like and i was like i thought that was a real thing um but yeah the suicide seems suspicious but there's no reason to like link bill clinton to this yet other than it benefits him maybe maybe not even definitively there were also reports of blonde hair and red carpet fibers on foster's suit jacket and semen in his underwear which several outlets suggest was significant they theorized that foster had been murdered by a secret mistress with blonde hair wrapped in a carpet and then dropped off at the park where his body would eventually be discovered according to them the gun found at the scene was foster's gun and it had been used to end his life but foster had not been the one to pull the trigger they also argued that the entire police investigation had been rushed in order to prevent any media outlets from delving into speculation so what damaging information did foster have that could have placed a target on his back well according to some outlets foster was in possession of incriminating documents related to another clinton era scandal known as the whitewater controversy for now all you need to know about whitewater is around the same time as the travelgate scandal bill clinton was under investigation for his past business dealing with a man named james mcdougall mcdougall and whitewater will both be discussed at length in another section because spoiler alert mcdougall also turned up dead under mysterious circumstances anyway according to the conspiracy shortly after his death foster's office was raided by another of bill clinton's personal attorneys and those incriminating documents were removed under the cover of night and hidden from the authorities altogether these claims made for a very convincing narrative a narrative that has never fully faded from public consciousness however i must be the bearer of bad news almost everything presented so far can be explained away rather simply and the information needed to dispel this theory was uncovered just uh, just years after foster's death in 1997 while trying to prove foster's death was not a suicide a right-wing publishing group no, group known as regnery publishing house reached out to true crime author dan moldea to research and write a book for them on the subject before receiving this offer moldea had researched and written several other books about sensitive topics at the time including the killing of robert f kennedy an investigation of motive means and opportunity and evidence dismissed the inside story of the police investigation of oj simpson impressed with his works the higher up at regnery the higher ups at regnery hoped that moldea's research and subsequent book would confirm their beliefs however when the book they had final finance was submitted it was titled a washington tragedy how the death of vinston foster ignited a political firestorm and if you're going to guess from the title it concluded the exact opposite good for you what's your name dan moldea you probably know about this publishing house society and their political leanings 
And you're probably like, they're, you know what they want in their book. And you're just like, no, that's not what the evidence shows. I like you. That's very cool. The publishing house then fought against the book's release, but Mondeo fought harder and won. According to him, the very first thing that sparked this conspiracy was the statement given to the media by police, Robert, police major Robert Hines, in which he claimed there had been no exit wound on the back of Foster's head. However, Hines' claim turned out to be untrue. There was an exit wound, and as Maldia stated in interviews, Hines had simply been flustered at the time of the interview and had said the wrong thing to quote. I don't think there was anything nefarious here. He was being approached by reporters, and he wanted to say something. As for the incriminating document, that were removed from Foster's office, Maldea concluded something that like this did happen, but it wasn't as shady as the media made it seem. In a statement released by White House Communications Director Mark Guerin, Guerin states, Following the death of Vincent Foster and following the examination of the files in his office on July the 22nd, 1993 by White House Counsel Nussbaum in the presence of representatives of various law enforcement agencies, Mr. Foster's files were distributed as follows. 1. Those files pertaining to his White House duties remained in the Council's offices. 2. Those files that were personal to Mr. Foster and his family were sent to his family's attorney, Jim Hamilton, and three, those files that pertain to the personal legal affairs of the President and Mrs. Clinton, including documents relating to their personal tax returns, the filing of Whitewater Development Corp tax returns, and the disposition of their interest in Whitewater, all of which were preserved, were sent to the Clinton's personal attorney, Robert Barnett, and later David E. Kendall, both of Williams and Connolly. As for the blonde hair, red carpet, and semen found on Foster's body, these can easily be explained away in a number of different ways, none of which involved the Clintons. Maybe Foster was having an affair with a blonde woman. Maybe he wasn't. It is irrelevant. Maybe he took his jacket off and laid it on the carpet to have sex with her. It does not prove anything. Everything related to the hair, carpet, and semen is circumstantial, and the only reason that we're discussing them is because of the 90s speculation of tabloid journalists. So, with these claims out of the way, what's left? Well, we still haven't addressed the forged suicide note slash resignation letter. Yeah, that's the really suspicious thing. The other stuff's like, okay, that's fine, but that is like weird. As stated earlier, three handwriting experts each asserted that the note was unequivocally a forgery. However, the FBI quickly stepped in and released their own assessment, concluding that it was genuine. Other independent handwriting experts came to the same conclusion. Oh, okay. Handwriting is just not that reliable then, is it? So what's going on here? Were the three handwriting experts lying? Were they themselves conspiracy theorists? Well, as explained by investigators, the document the original experts had each examined was a photocopy of the letter and not the original letter itself. This copy did not reveal the finer details of Foster's penmanship, and what first appeared suspicious was just the result of poor image quality. As for the deviations in Foster's writing style, they pointed out that the letter had been penned by a shaky hand guided by a man on the verge of suicide, and that's really all there is to it. After an extensive investigation into Foster's death was conducted, it was concluded that, in sum, based on all the available evidence, which is considerable, the OIC, Office of Independent Counsel, agrees with the conclusion reached by every official entity that has examined the issue. Mr. Foster committed suicide by gunshot in Fort Macy Park on July the 20th, 1993. Um, what about the fingerprints? Is that just because it, did they actually have, it was just a photocopy, like an actual photocopy of the letter? Otherwise, how do we explain the, the, the fingerprints? No fingerprints on it or anything like that. I guess it must have been the photocopy. Otherwise, like, what's the possible... Like, that's weird. Dawn Henry and Kevin Ives. So, Vince Foster's death may have been a nothing burger, but now we need to go back in time to the 1980s and talk about two deaths, and I'm personally convinced are related to some sort of cover-up. On August the 23rd, 1987, at around 4 a.m., a Union Pacific locomotive pulling over 6,000 tons of goods was on its way to Little Rock, Arkansas, when something strange happened. As it passed through the town of Alexander, the train's engineer noticed two teenage boys lying on the tracks approximately 300 feet ahead of him. Immediately, the engineer engaged the brake and desperately began blowing on the horn, but it was too late. What? what I am lit. Is this? What, what? What? I am literally making another video about this right now. Um, for Casual Criminalist, another show. What are the odds? Uh, a new writer and I are going through his first script, and this is his first script. What are the chances of that? I'd never heard of this before. I was literally doing this this morning. <laughs> wow. Wow. Immediately, the engineer engaged the brakes and began desperately blowing the horn, but it was too late. Because the train was moving at over 50 miles per hour and carrying so much weight, it was simply unable to stop, and the boys never even tried to move. 40 minutes later, officers were on the scene, and the teens were identified as 16-year-old Don Henry and 17-year-old Kevin Ives. Near the tracks, police found a hunting rifle and a flashlight, which indicated they'd likely left home earlier in the night to go spotlight hunting. Spotlight hunting involves shining a bright light into the dark forest to illuminate the eyes of nearby animals. The following day, an autopsy was performed by Dr. Fahmy Malak, a state medical examiner, and he found extremely high levels of THC in both teens' bodies. 
extremely high levels. So, essentially, they were mega high. And when I say high, I'm talking about the equivalent of over 20 marijuana cigarettes each. <laughs> I remember a friend of a friend's. Like, God, this is... I haven't thought about this in decades. But I remember going around to a mate's house, and another mate of his was there. And we were just all hanging out, and we were talking about, like, weed or something. And she's like, oh, yes, marijuana cigarettes. And I'm like... <laughs> these marijuana cigarettes other than your mum. According to Malik, this would have been more than enough to leave them incapacitated and unable to hear or feel as the train approached. Holy sh**. I don't think I've ever been that high. As such, the police determined that while high, the teens had likely laid across the tracks to try and look up at the stars and been hit without ever waking up. Bruh. It's like, bro, I got a great idea, man. Let's have a lie down on the tracks and watch the stars. Like, why are we lying on the tracks? There's perfectly good grass nearby. <laughs> tracks are comfortable. Their deaths were ruled a tragic accident and touted as yet another reason to avoid the devil's lettuce. But here's where things get interesting. The following year, in March 1988, the parents of both Don and Kevin requested that the teens' bodies be exhumed so a second autopsy could be performed. The request was granted, and two other independent examiners from out of state, James Gary from Texas and Joseph Burton from Georgia, were brought in to verify. By Dr. Malik's findings. They both disputed Malik's claim that 20 marijuana cigarettes worth of THC was present in the teen's, teen's bloodstream and stated it was significantly less, likely closer to one or two cigarettes worth. Additionally, although Malik's original autopsy had made no mention of it, there were other notable wounds on both teens' bodies that had not resulted from the train accident. Kevin's skull had been crushed prior to being run over. That ain't something you should be missing in the autopsy. I mean, I guess the being hit by a train probably is like, oof, bro, why is this fracture? Because he was hit by a train. But whoever, okay, so they found out this happened later. Kevin's skull had been crushed prior to being run over, and Don had been stabbed in the back with a knife. Following these new autopsies, both deaths were, deaths were now reclassified as homicide. Like Vince Foster's death, some conspiracy theorists latched onto the idea that Bill Clinton had ordered a cover-up of the teen's death because they had witnessed something in the woods that night that they shouldn't have. Ugh, come on. As a reminder, Bill Clinton was serving as Arkansas's governor when this occurred because he had not yet been elected to, to the White House. According to this theory, the teens had witnessed a drug drop occurring at an airfield that was nearby the section of tracks on which their bodies were discovered. This isn't actually a wild assumption because they were well there were well-documented cartel activities happening in the area in those years that many people in town were aware of at the time. Yeah, that seems entirely likely, and the crushed song getting stabbed in the back feels a bit cartel -y, doesn't it? But you know who's not involved? Bill Clinton. Because he's not a drug cartel guy, he's a politician. <laughs> People assumed that the teens must have stumbled upon one of these drops, been spotted, killed, and then placed on the tracks to make their deaths appear like an accident. No legitimate evidence to support this theory was ever presented, and the assumption that Bill Clinton was involved basically stems from another conspiracy that he was a secret drug user, drug dealer, drug trafficker, while serving as the state's governor. He, uh, chill. He might be a drug user. That's fine. But why? You wouldn't. If you're the state governor, you're not going to be into drug dealing and drug trafficking are you he's also a lawyer he makes enough money this is yet another conspiracy that we'll be speaking about in a later section however as it pertains to the deaths of don henry and kevin ives there were a few notable occurrences that indicate that there may have been something rotten in the state of arkansas after the teens' deaths were reclassified, the prosecuting attorney in charge of their case, Dan Harmon, uh, was discovered to be a drug dealer himself. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I mean, I was like, lawyers don't need to be drug dealers. They make enough money. And here we have Dan Harmon. I take it all back. And possibly one of the people involved in the teens' deaths. After his arrest, several people came forward claiming to have information about Dan Harmon, but each died under mysterious circumstances before being able to testify against him. Wait, what the was Dan Harmon like a mob lawyer but also drug dealing on the side? Why would your mob lawyer also be dealing your drugs? Uh, not mob, uh, cartel lawyer. Why would he also be dealing drugs? He should just be doing your lawyer he should have like relatively clean hands no also around the same time another person believed to be involved in the case keith mccaskey died after being stabbed in the back by an unknown assailant who was never identified this was all very convenient for prosecutor turns drug lord dan Harmon. but the biggest mind blower in my opinion is the fact that all the autopsies performed on the people mentioned in this section were performed by dr farmy malik the examiner who ostensibly lied about his findings on the teen's original autopsy report can you say convict of interest Jesus. Could this be a cover-up of a cover-up of a cover-up? Look, obviously when drug cartels are involved, just about anything is possible. And like I said at the beginning of this section, I believe there is something going on here. I also believe that some official agency should reopen this case. However, there is no evidence that the Clintons were involved. Fully agree, this is mad suspicious. Get that case cracked wide open. But Bill Clinton is not involved, in my opinion. 
multiple aviation accidents next up is c victor riser the second his son and four other unrelated people who just happened to be collateral damage on one of bill clinton's murderous rampages <laughs> at least that's how it's pushed by some outlets on july the 30th 1992 the six aforementioned individuals were riding in a privately chartered single engine aircraft near dillingham alaska when tragedy struck yeah single engine aircraft i feel like i don't know they're like helicopters they're they're they're, they're, they're a little bit dangerous <laughs> The plane had taken off from Bristol Bay Lodge's uh, fishing lodge, ranked fourth best in the world, and, edit- and was headed 50 miles southwest to a lodge ca- owned camp near the Togiak River. This is where the six passengers, all of whom were guests of the resort, planned to fish that day. According to flight records, the route the pilots had chartered was over a mountainous region with peaks approximately 4,000 feet high, and before taking off, he had been assured by the local flight operator that the weather was clear along the entire route. However, that day, the weather was proving unpredictable. Shortly after takeoff, the pilots saw that the pass he intended to fly through was closed off by low clouds and with less than a mile of visibility around him he was forced to reverse course while doing this the plane failed to maintain airspeed stalled and then plummeted into the mountains below the pilot was the only survivor now when this crash first occurred it made headlines but not for the reasons that we're about to discuss c victor riser the second was an important man and so his death was noteworthy on its own but it wasn't until linda thompson's list was released that people began to look closer at his relationship with the clintons as it turns out he was a former national finance co-chairman under clinton and it was alleged that he was killed because he knew too much theories of what really caused the crash soon surfaced which include a mechanical sabotage a bomb hidden inside the engine compartment and even an assertion that the pilot was a hired professional hitman and the crash had been staged <laughs> uh professional hitmen usually like to get paid and not killed it's like okay we've got a hit job for you what you have to do is you have to hijack this plane and crash it into a mountain and you're like okay you got an exit plan like what am i doing parachuting in the place like no 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 you just go down with it <laughs> Be like, I'm gonna pass on this job, mate. Thank you, though. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> and then Bill Clinton's like, no problem. <laughs> Not really. Thank you, Alex Jones, for that last one. Alex Jones for that last one, allegedly. Really, it's so boneheaded. The fact that the pilot was the only survivor. Oh, what he was the okay. Never mind. Again, Matt, you keep doing it. I take it all back. He survived a plane crash. Wow. But this wasn't the only suspicious plane crash that occurred around that time. Fifteen months later, on September the 10th, 1993, also, he probably didn't, like, parachute out, did he? He probably just survived with horrific injuries. So it probably wasn't, like, the best plan still. I stand by it. I stand by it. Fifteen months later, on the 10th of September 1993, Dr. Stanley Hurd, a chairman of the National Chiropractic Healthcare Advisory Committee and doctor for several members of the Clinton family, died when the plane he was riding in caught fire. Wait, he's actually a doctor? Wait, uh, is this like an American doctor where you're like, anyone can call themselves a doctor? Because National Chiropractic, chiro- Chiropractic. So is he their chiropractor or is he their doctor? Because there's a big difference. Because one of those people actually does something and the other one does something that you think's going on in your head. I'm not saying which one because I wouldn't want to get in trouble with the big chiro but, or big medicine or whatever. But let's just say I got my opinions on which one it is and I hope yours are the same. He died when the plane he was riding in caught fire. There were no survivors during this crash, and Heard's attorney, Steve Dixon, was on board with him. What was notable about this accident, other than the fact that both Heard and Dixon both knew the Clintons, was the fact that Heard had just come from a meeting at the White House where he had discussed the Clinton administration's health care plan. This meeting had supposedly not gone well. Had Bill snuck on board and planted a device rigged to explode? Well, probably not. The plane Heard and Dixon were flying had been badly maintained and was not even the plane they normally flew. Their normal plane had developed a mechanical issue while en route to DC and they had rented another to avoid staying overnight while waiting for repairs. They cheaped out and paid the price. Oh, with, with, no. <laughs> no, 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 that's not how it should work with aviation. <laughs> it's not like, oh yeah, I've taken the cheaper planes, I've got more chance of death. It's not like flying Ryanair is more dangerous. There are basic standards that have to be kept up. Although, apparently, they, they weren't or something. <laughs> or is that just what the government wants you to believe? Jerry Parks. As a career private investigator, Jerry Parks acted as the head of security for Bill Clinton's campaign headquarters during his first campaign for president in 1992. On September 26, 1993, he was murdered while exiting a Mexican restaurant in Little Rock, Arkansas by a man in a car wielding a 9mm pistol. Well, he's also a private investigator. He's probably made a few enemies, hasn't he? I always thought being a private investigator would be an awesome job. Like, I mean, I imagine in real life it's extremely boring and you're just mostly watching someone's house for when someone leaves and has an affair with something, someone. But I always imagined it more like, you know, <laughs> Sherlock Holmes and but it's not. 
And also you'd have to be really good at it. Parks was shot 10 times and he died at the scene. No suspect was ever located and his murder remains unsolved to this day. Shortly after this occurred, a straight-to-VHS film titled Bill and Hillary's Circle of Power was released and it made some truly incredible claims. Without providing much evidence, it stated that Bill, Hillary and their inner circle had committed insider trading, racketeering and murder while also participating in various other illegal activities to help obfuscate said crimes. It's like... <laughs> Insider trading. Ra I don't even know what racketeering is. Racketeering and murder. It's like you're you're like insider trading. Okay, racketeer. I assume it's some sort of like white collar crime. Yeah, sure. Okay, maybe murder. Really? <laughs> I mean, like this is. It goes from like yeah, possibly to conspiracy theory. What is racketeering? I got to know what racketeering is. Look up. Racketeering is a type of organized crime which a person is. Person set up coercive, fraudulent extortion and other illegal coordinated scheme or operation to collect a profit. Okay, so it's just like, um, let me give me money or I'm gonna, uh, you know, destroy your store. You gonna give me my money? Or protection, like protection rackets, right? That ra ah, look, racketeering, protection racket. Boom, there we go, I figured it out. While also participating in various other illegal activities to help obfuscate said crimes, such as arson and witness intimidation, it also leaned into the aforementioned drug dealing governor conspiracy, which stated that as governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton had facilitated the importation and sale of hard drugs in his state by working alongside South American cartels and ordering the state's drug enforcement task force to allow these cartels to operate within the state with relative impunity. As evidence, the film primarily uses the testimony of people who either knew or had known the Clintons at one point, and one of the people featured was Jerry Parks' own son, Gary Parks. Gary claimed that at the time of his father's death, Jerry was in possession of a substantial amount of evidence linking Cl the Clintons to these crimes, as well as other evidence showing that Bill himself had misappropriated Arkansas state funds to purchase sexual favors from five, five separate women at an Arkansas hotel that he visited frequently. According to Gary, his father had acquired this information while working for the Clinton campaign and was actively trying to blackmail the Clinton presidential administration when he was gunned down. The information was supposedly kept in a file Gary believes was stolen and destroyed by someone working for the Clintons around the time of his father's death. Neither Gary nor anyone else associated with the film has ever been able to prove that a file existed in the first place. This is the most suspicious one so far to me. I'd say that this is fairly suspicious, but again, there's no proof. I don't really believe it. It's just the most likely one so far. Nevertheless, once these allegations were made, Jerry Parks' name was added to the list of the Clintons' alleged victims. As a side note, the film also featured the story of Don Henry and Kevin Ives. Kevin Ives' mother appeared in the film and to summarize stated that she was convinced Bill Clinton was responsible for her son's death. Others interviewed in the film later stated that they would not have agreed to give statements to the film's producers if they knew how unhinged the claims against the Clintons would be. Yeah, be very careful. Like, I don't know, I'm always like, with the media, I'm always like super careful, like, you can't quote me on this. You can't quote me on that. Don't say that. I don't, I don't agree to this. Like, I just never do this. I'm just like, no, 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 no. You twist it all around. Don't do it. <laughs> I'd never agree to be in this. They'd be like, do you want to be interviewed with this? I'd be like, fuck no. <laughs> I don't even know what you're up to, but I don't want to be involved. James McDougall. Now, do you remember the Whitewater scandal that I mentioned while speaking about Vince Foster? Well, it's finally time to return to that discussion and talk about another related death, that of James McDougall, one of Bill Clinton's former investment partners who died in prison shortly before his scheduled release. Now, let me back up and provide some much-needed context. According to official records, Bill and Hillary Clinton entered a real estate investment partnership with husband and wife James and Susan McDougal in 1977. The plan was to construct a community of vacation homes along the White River in Flippin, Arkansas. <laughs> Really? <laughs> to cater to wealthy individuals and primar primarily based in nearby Chicago and Detroit. In pursuit of this plan, the four of them founded the Whitewater Development Corporation, of which Bill, Hillary, James, and Susan each received an equal share of ownership. They began then they then purchased 230 acres of land. Jesus Christ, that's a big plot. For two hundred and three thousand dollars. What? That it's <laughs> that's insanely cheap. Two hundred and thirty acres? I have a house that's on like Less than half an acre. He's like a quarter of an acre. And it's so expensive. Like, what the f***? I guess it's because I live in a city and this is like the middle of Arkansas or something. But still. But before construction could begin, the economy went belly up and interest in the area dried up. Initially, all four fully intended to hold out and wait for an economic upturn to begin construction. They even built a show home to draw prospective buyers to the area. But after several years, the project was scrapped, the partnership was dissolved, and all joint assets were liquidated. In total, Bill and Hillary lost an estimated $69,000, whilst James and Susan lost significantly more. 
Why did they lose more? I thought they were all equal in on this. Following this failure, both the Clintons and the McDougals suffered even harder times. In 1980, Bill lost his re-election bid for Arkansas governor, although he would win again two years later, and Jim lost his job working under Bill as one of the governor's economic aides. In the years that followed, Bill would recover well financially during his decade-long journey toward the White House. However, James and Susan would continue to struggle. In 1982, the McDougals acquired two banks, renaming them Madison Bank and Trust and the Madison Guarantee Saving and Loan. They're not doing that bad, though, are they? <laughs> it's like they had hard financial times. And then they bought two banks. <laughs> Is this like rich people hard times where it's like, oh, no. Oh, God. Oh, no. I'm going to have to fly commercial? Are you f kidding? <laughs> They then invested in another real estate project near Little Rock, Arkansas, called Castle Grande, using funds borrowed from one of their own banks. However, like Whitewater, this venture failed, which also caused Madison Guarantee Bank to fail as well several years later. This was a very big deal, because when a bank fails, the U.S. government must step in and clean up the mess, a task that cost taxpayers an estimated $73 million in 1990s money. These, they bought a bank that could fail to the extent of $73 million? I'm sorry, but they weren't doing badly, surely, like... <laughs> That's an insane amount of money. This was unfortunate for the McDougals, who found themselves in the middle of a large federal investigation. But they were safe because they hadn't done anything illegal, right? I get the feeling, like, if I was in their situation and I was like, "Cool, I'm gonna like finance this like um, development, whatever the f it was," and I'd be like, "I'm gonna get a loan from my own bank," I would first ring my lawyer and my accountant and be like, "Guys, can I borrow money from my own bank? Because that's the thing that I'd find like weird here." That's what I find weird, and I'll definitely check in. And they'd, they'd either be like, yes, of course, it's your bank. And I'll be like, grand, thank you. Have a good day. Or I'll be like, or they'd be like, no, you f***ing kidding me? Do you want to go to prison? And then I'll be like, okay, let's not do that. <laughs> Done. No, as it turns out, financing a personal venture using your own bank is a risky business, which is why the law states that a person can borrow a maximum of $600,000 from a bank they own and not a penny more. Bingo. Yes. I'm glad I would have checked that with my lawyer. James had borrowed almost two million, but he had attempted to hide this fact by funneling that money through other shell companies and intermediaries. Oh no, and he knows he's doing wrong. <laughs> I'd be like, I didn't know. And they'd be like, yeah, but you hid it through like seven other companies. <laughs> and like, oh, f <laughs> the investigation caused quite a stir in both Arkansas and DC. However, nothing serious would come of it for the Clintons until March of 1992. What's this got to do with the Clintons? They were just involved with these people previously, and then they went on to do something completely different. When, during the Democratic Party's primary election season, the New York Times published an article that highlighted the Clintons and the McDougals' previous business relationship. That's bizarre. Like, what's that got to do with them? That'd be like, oh yes, Simon, a mate of yours went to prison for murder. And I'll be, and they'd be like, well, we better look into you. And I'll be like, well, fuck, I didn't murder anybody. <laughs> Just because I once knew a dude. <laughs> as far as I know, none of my friends have been sent to prison for murder. <laughs> so far. The link caused both Bill and Hillary to recommend to the, F the, to the FBI as witnesses in the ongoing investigation into Madison Guarantee Bank's failure. Having their names attached to such an investigation was obviously not ideal for a potential president. Yeah, because even though it's completely reasonable and you can obviously explain it, people are going to be like, oh, corrupt Bill. Uh, what's a good? Corrupt Clinton. <laughs> Shady Bill. In 1993, after Bill won the election anyway, things got even worse for him and Hillary when a loan officer named David Hale claimed that Bill had illegally pressured him into approving a $300,000 loan for Susan McDougall as part of the Castle Grande venture. After this, it was also learned that one of the law firms that provided counsel to Madison Guarantee Bank during their time in business was Rose Law Firm, the firm where Hillary Clinton was employed. Then, in case that wasn't enough, an allegation that Bill had misappropriated campaign finance funds during his prior gubernational... That's another glorious word, isn't it? Oh, gubernatorial! What the f*** is that word? What does that even mean? Gubernatorial. Oh my god, what is that? Goober. <laughs> Look up. A governor in an administration leader is ranking under... The, oh, it's for governor. It's the governor's campaign. Gubernatorial. Uh, soon resurfaced... That's a great word. Gubernatorial. <laughs> <laughs> Soon resurfaced, the further tied them to claims of corruption and financial fraud. So essentially, although they themselves were not investors in the Castle Grande scheme, the Clintons' names were all over the deal, and although they claimed to have done nothing illegal, a separate and much larger investigation into the Clintons was launched that became known as the Whitewater Investigation. If you recall, Vince Foster was allegedly in possession of incriminating information related to this investigation at the time of his suicide. However, while the committee in charge of this investigation was initially created to focus solely on Whitewater, the hearings 
proceedings grew to include many more allegations, including those surrounding Monica Lewinsky, and ultimately resulted in Clinton being recommended for impeachment based on 11 separate offenses, including perjury, obstruction of justice, witness tampering, and abuse of power. However, none of these were the result of the Whitewater or Castle Grande investigations. They all came from the Monica Lewinsky investigation. Okay. I mean, if he really pressured that person to, to give the, the bank person or whatever to give the loan, that is really not on. That's the dodgiest thing that I can see here. But if they're killed or whatever, it's like, no. And they're only like tangentially involved. And killing them is just going to bring way more eyes on things. <laughs> In the end, most people know how the story ends for Clinton. He was impeached by the House of Representatives, acquitted by the Senate, and remained in office until his second term was finished in 2001. He never received any real consequences for his actions while president, but James and Susan McDougall did, as did 13 others involved in Madison Guarantee Bank scheme, many of whom were Clinton's own former associates. James McDougall alone was sentenced to 81 years in prison for his role. Are you... What?! <laughs> He borrowed some money from his own bank that was like, what, three times the legal amount? What the f***? That should say like 81 months or 81 days, 81 years? Bro, you gotta be like, Clinton, get elected, get elected, get elected. Come on, Clinton. He's probably like Trump right now. Get elected, get elected, get elected. Because that's the only way you're getting out of prison. <laughs> allegedly. But this is where things get truly interesting. James was found guilty early on in relation to Clinton's other investigations, and to have his sentence reduced, agreed to help investigators by providing information on a wide range of matters, including matters previously unknown to the prosecution. This is likely how the other 13 defendants were able to be convicted, and James's sentence was reduced to only 3.5 years. Yes, now that seems a lot more reasonable, doesn't it? What did I say? 81 months? That's even longer than that. That's perfect. 3.5 years, it seems, even that seems a bit stiff, doesn't it? Jesus. After the other sentences were handed out, Bill Clinton pardoned several of his former associates, including Stephen Smith, one of his former aides, who was found guilty of conspiracy to misapply Clinton's own campaign funds. He also pardoned Chris Wade, a banker found guilty of loan fraud, Robert Palmer, an appraiser found guilty of fraud, and Susan McDougall herself, who was convicted on multiple counts of fraud. Clinton did not, however, pardon James McDougall. It is theorized, although not confirmed because his testimony is sealed, that James's cooperation may have aided in Clinton's impeachment. Following this, James served the majority of his sentence with good behavior and was on the fast track to early release. However, at age 57, he suffered a massive cardiac incident just a few months before the parole hearing was expected to grant his release. Well, he is 57. You are in heart attack territory, aren't you? Before this, conspiracy theorists were already buzzing around the entire Clinton investigation like flies as they continued to push dozens of interconnected conspiracies. But when James McDougall dropped dead just before his release after being snubbed for a pardon, they shifted all of their focus to him. What had really caused McDougall's death? Heart attack didn't make sense to most people because James was relatively young and did nice 57's heart attack territory and did not suffer any major health problems. Stress from being in prison could have caused it, but he had already served over two years without incident, which made this theory unlikely. Had McDougal been killed in, as revenge for his cooperation with the prosecution? Had he been killed because Clinton feared he would reveal other damaging information after his impending release? Well, there's no evidence that I have seen, yet the conspiracy lives on. Again, it's like, yeah, okay, it benefits Clinton. Maybe. Did he do it? Mm, no, there's no evidence for that. Many more deaths. Now, in this section, I'd like to pick up the pace of it and name off several more often cited people, some of whom were on Linda's original list and some of whom were not, and provide a few basic details about their relationship to the Clintons, their officially recognized cause of death, and any other relevant details about their lives. Unless specified otherwise, assume the motive for each alleged murder was the deceased had information that could either harm the Clintons or the larger Democratic Party. In February of 1993, during the siege in Waco, Texas, three of the four ATF agents killed in the famous two-and-a-half-hour gunfight were former body of Clinton during his run for president. Their names were Todd McKeon and Conway LeBlue of New Orleans, Louisiana, Steve Willis of Houston, Texas, and Robert Williams of Little Rock, Arkansas, Bill Clinton's hometown. They were assumed to have been reassigned and killed after witnessing Clinton engage in shady dealings. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> In May of that same year, four Marines, all of whom were members of Clinton's personal helicopter squadron, were killed when, a, when the Black Hawk they were flying suddenly fell out of the sky near Quantico, Virginia. Clinton himself had ridden inside this helicopter prior to the accident, and what some people found most suspicious was the fact that only one man who died there day had been part of the helicopter's regular crew. The other three had been reassigned to it last minute. Also, while shifting through the wreckage, all media personnel, personnel and cameras had been banned from the scene, which only increased speculation. 
The following month, in June of 1993, Paul Wiltshire, an investigator looking into the deaths of the aforementioned ATF agents, Clinton's alleged link to the Arkansas drug problem and the Whitewater scandal, was discovered dead inside his home after submitting a 99-page report to Attorney General Janet Reno three weeks prior. He was found sitting on his toilet, but his exact cause of death was not determined. Three years later, in 1996, Ron Brown, the former Secretary of Commerce who worked under Bill Clinton during his first term as president, died in 1996, Boeing CT-43A plane crash alongside 33 others. At the time of his death, he was a material witness in the lawsuit filed against Clinton's Commerce Department. Three years later, in 1999, John F. Kennedy Jr. was also killed in a plane crash while running against Hillary during the 2000 U.S. Senate election in New York. According to polling, Kennedy was the favorite to win. However, after his death, Hillary won instead. Again, all of these, I'm not really commenting on them much, is because it's just, yeah, people close to them died. They're also super powerful, interconnected people. They're gonna know an incredible number of people and work with an incredible number of people, and some of them are gonna die. Like, I don't know that many people, I don't know work with that many people, but some of them die. It's just how it is. <laughs> And now we've mentioned a death supposedly committed in furtherance of Hillary's political career instead of Bill's, let's keep that train rolling by skipping ahead to the 2016 presidential election. That year, a man named Seth Rich, a Democratic staff member working for Hillary's campaign, was murdered. Officially, police announced that he had been killed in a robbery gone wrong while jogging. However, none of his valuables, his wallet, cell phone, or watch, had been stolen. As for motivation, it was speculated that Rich was the person responsible for the 2016 DNC email leak that was picked up and spread by WikiLeaks that year. This theory was only strengthened when WikiLeaks' official Twitter account offered a $20,000 reward for information related to Rich's death. However, the US's official position was that the leak had been perpetrated by a Russian hijacking group known as Guccifer 2. Fox News and other news outlets issued a retraction after this, but many remain unconvinced that it was a random robbery. In June of that same year, Christopher Sign, a reporter who uncovered evidence of a secret meeting that had occurred between Bill Clinton and former Attorney General Loretta Lynch, was found dead in his Alabama home. His death was ruled a suicide. However, theorists claim that his death did not result from an effort to cover up any information. It was done to warn, warn rather reporters to keep their mouths shut. In 2021, former Haitian President Jovenel Moise was assassinated by several gunmen while in his home during a period of nationwide civil unrest caused by a number of different controversies. Haiti is in so much trouble. I've made a few geographics videos. Uh, I've made a few warographics videos about this, and it's like Haiti is just. It's a big, big problem. If you haven't seen what's going on there, it's just. It's so sad. It's so fed up. During this time, rioters had been calling for his resignation, but theorists were quick to tie his death to the Clintons due to a past statement by Moist where he had condemned the Clinton Foundation for building unsafe structures in Haiti following an earthquake. These structures were reportedly shoddily built using toxic materials laced with formaldehyde that were causing people to become ill. As the theory goes, this was a bad look for the Clintons and their non-profit group, so they orchestrated his deposition. Viol violently. QAnon followers played a pivotal part in spreading this theory, just as they had done several years prior with the death that we'll be talking about next. Jeffrey Epstein If there was ever a person more likely to be killed by Bill Clinton than Jeffrey Epstein, I cannot imagine who it would be. However, this channel has already done a wonderful video on this conspiracy, so I'm going to keep this section very brief and only mention the facts necessary to discuss Epstein's relationship to the Clintons, specifically Bill Clinton. For more information on Epstein himself, go watch that episode. It's fantastic. <laughs> I did enjoy that one. It, it's The Epstein stuff is so suspicious. Holy sh**. That's suspicious. Keeping things short, Epstein's body was found in his jail cell on August the 10th, 2019, after his supposed suicide. At the time of his death, he was facing charges of sex trafficking after years of allegedly grooming and engaging in sex acts with girls as young as 11 on his private island, Little St. James, aka P-Word Island. <laughs> Epstein is... <laughs> Can you imagine? Who, I wonder who owns that now. Like, I'm sure it's like a beautiful island or whatever, but it's like, yeah, uh, purchase beautiful Little St. James, also known as P-Word Island. And you'd just be like chilling out there as like a billionaire and your private islands and being like, oh man, there's some horrible shit that went down here, didn't it? I don't like it. I want another island. Epstein was also very well connected, having been friends with many wealthy and powerful men from all over the world. And according to his accusers, some of those men and women could also participate in the abuse. Epstein kept the contact information for many of his friends, some of who some people claimed were also his clients, in a little black book that was discovered after his death. The names of Donald Trump, Bill Cosby, Prince Andrew, Woody Allen, and many more were all listed in that book. Oh, and let's not forget Bill Clinton's name. Keep in mind that most of these allegations have never been proven in court due to Epstein's untimely death, but like I said, 
go and watch the other video. Now, I'm not even going to touch the whole Epstein didn't kill himself debate with a 10-foot pole, but there are people who believe he was murdered to help obfuscate the sex crimes of the world's powerful elites. Of the people who believe this, many also believe that Bill Clinton is the person most likely responsible. So, is that what I'm saying? No, absolutely not, because there's no tangible evidence to support this claim. Here are the only facts we know about Bill Clinton's relationship with Epstein. Bill has denied being close friends with Epstein. However, he was an infrequent visitor of Little St. James, and Epstein kept multiple photographs of Bill inside his home. Bill claims that these trips were taken as part of his work for the Clinton Foundation. However, there are also photos available online of Bill receiving a neck massage from one of Epstein's accusers after flying on Epstein's plane, the Lolita Express, in 2002. Much speculation has resulted from this photograph, but the accuser in the picture has stated on records that Bill Clinton was a perfect gentleman during their brief interaction. Okay, I mean, if the accuser, one of the accusers, like, no, Bill's one of the good ones, and like, came forward with all this other horrible sh then I'll be like, oh, I'm quite inclined to believe them. Why would they die? <laughs> Beyond the Clintons. So now we've touched on every death that I see as relevant, where does that leave us? Well, before I sat down to write this episode, I was only somewhat familiar with this conspiracy and curious about what, if any, real evidence that was out there to support it. And now I've spent several weeks reading every credible source that I get my hands on, as well as a few shady ones from the dark parts of the internet. This is what I've concluded. Are the Clintons corrupt? In my opinion, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Are they more corrupt than other politicians in Washington? Perhaps, or maybe it seems so because of the amount of scrutiny they were placed under during the 90s. Are they murderers? No, I don't believe so. There is simply no credible evidence that links any of the events mentioned throughout this episode to the Clintons, and the only death that remains even remotely suspicious besides Epstein's is that of Don Henry and Kevin Ives, which was only included in Linda Thompson's original list because Bill Clinton was governor of the state at the time of the murders. Bill Clinton. Likewise, the most convincing feature of this conspiracy is the sheer number of supposed victims, and that still proves nothing because most of the cases are tangentially related to the Clintons at best. Yes, totally agree. I agree with everything here. So that is my answer. However, because I was only able to go in depth on a few of the deaths for the sake of time, I know most believers in this conspiracy won't be satisfied with my answer. Honestly, Matt, though, even if you did go into all of them, people are still not going to be satisfied because people who believe in conspiracy theories really believe in conspiracy theories. I believe. I believe. The point of some obscure piece of evidence or death that I didn't mention accused me of being part of the conspiracy. However, if you'll allow me one last opportunity, I'd like to take a different approach, a broader approach, to explain the reason this conspiracy is so convincing to some people. And that's that it was designed to be. Throughout the rest of this script, with the help of information obtained from Snopes.com, I'm going to explain the way body count lists are crafted. I can do this because, if you're not aware, the Clinton body count is not unique. Throughout history, there have been dozens, if not hundreds, of documented body count lists, and creating one is quite rudimentary because there are a number of tricks that conspiracy theorists use, sometimes subconsciously, but oftentimes on purpose, to make their claims seem more believable. And to make this more interesting, I'm going to present this information as a step-by-step -step how-to guide so that the audience can craft your own body count conspiracy. All you need is a little information and a complete disregard for ethics. Good news! I've got information and no ethics. Let's go! Hashtag not legal advice. The first trick is to make a very, very long list of victims. This is what Linda Thompson did, and it works because in some people's minds, a larger number translates to a higher likelihood. After all, one or two questionable deaths can easily be dismissed as coincidence, but 34? Surely not. Plus, a larger number Number is much more difficult to disprove because researching one or two cases is not difficult for the average reader, but researching several dozen cases is another story entirely. By the time someone has reached the end of your magnum list, they will or be far too exhausted to question anything you said, especially the finer details that may be somewhat dubious. And speaking of those finer details, let's talk about what you should and shouldn't present to your readers because compiling a big list won't do you any good if you are disproving your own claims in the next sentence. Remember, we're not trying to be objective here, we're trying to get people to buy into our conspiracy and possibly buy our upcoming book in hardback. Yep, it's always money. It's always money! In essence, if a piece of evidence supports your claims, focus on it heavily. If it doesn't, just disregard it. To see this in action, let's look at the case of Vince Foster. The fact that his friends, family, and colleagues all knew he was suffering from mental health problems before his suicide was completely ignored by most theorists because it didn't fit the narrative they were pushing. Some even claimed his family were in on the conspiracy, which is beyond wild, 
Or maybe it's genius. Also, nobody pushing the conspiracy ever asked questions like, if the Clintons were killing people to protect their image, why did Bill Clinton get impeached? Why wasn't Monica Lewinsky killed? Why were the people exposing this very body count list allowed to live? These are the types of questions that can be detrimental to a good conspiracy, which is exactly why you are not going to bring them up or acknowledge them. If someone else brings them up, simply ignore that person and accuse them of being a member of the deep state. Easy. The next trick revolves around how you present your evidence to your reader. You should play word games with them by presenting every fact as a claim and every claim as potentially dubious. This is what I've been doing throughout this entire episode. Instead of saying all of the evidence uncovered corroborates the police's theory of suicide, say, according to the official narrative, the police claim they were not able to uncover any evidence of homicide, but they have refused to release all their findings to the public and they will, rot will not return my many calls. <laughs> and make no mention that the findings you are requesting is a collection of close up graphic photographs of Vince Foster's gunshot wound. Yes, people did actually request those very disturbing photos to be released to the public and then complained when the request was denied. Likewise, you should also seek to overwhelm your reader with a tremendous amount of useless information while making that information seem both mysterious and incriminating. Most people lack the ability to think critically, and you can use this to your advantage. If a man dies from a fall during a rock climbing expedition and the police discover three protein bars in his backpack, don't assume that he was simply a hungry man in need of extra calories. Assume there must have been two other people with him, Bill and Hillary Clinton perhaps, and they must have been the ones to push him off the cliff. Keep people focused on those protein bars and don't let a lack of evidence stop you from jumping to some truly incredible conclusions. And just like that, your body count conspiracy is fully crafted and ready for release. But don't get comfortable because your work is just beginning. The final trick is to remain flexible and never stop defending your conspiracy. Keep feeding it for as long as possible, and if you can add more names over time, do it. People say, oh god, this is just like terrible advice. But hopefully it's just point out how stupid these things are. You are made of stupid. Stupid. People tend to believe that older claims are more credible, which is basically how all religions maintain any semblance of create credibility in the modern day. This is how the Clinton body count conspiracy was started and perpetuated for over three decades. And the fact that so many anti-Clinton Republicans latched onto this theory in an attempt to have Bill Clinton removed from office in the 90s was a major reason it has remained relevant. Remember, it wasn't just Alex Jones pushing this theory. The, the original list was delivered to Congress by an elected congressman, an act that in and of itself provides some level of credibility. Plus, years after Clinton's two terms were over, the conspiracy found new life among politicians like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert. However, if you're still unsatisfied with this vague explanation, let me offer a more specific reason as to why so many people involved with the Clintons have died. And that's that the Clintons have been involved in politics for four decades, and they've been in business themselves for even longer. In that time, they have met with, shaken hands with, partnered with, taken pictures with, gone to dinner with, and attended events with more individuals than most regular people will pass on the street in their entire lives. They've made friends and enemies, business partners and political rivals, and everything in between. Simply put, when you're rich and powerful, you are going to associate yourself with other rich and powerful people, and some of those people are going to die. Not by your hands or the hands of the Clintons, but in a number of any number of ways that normal people die. And if someone is determined enough, they are going to make those deaths fit their own sinister narrative. Maybe the Clintons did do it. Who knows? If Simon or I die in the immediate future, then just go ahead and add our names to that list as well. Yeah. But know that it's not Bill Clinton. Oh my god, Bill, no! <laughs> Thanks for being here.